This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. Each and every person on this planet, as a living human being, is physically composed primarily of protoplasm, which is largely carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus, with lesser amounts of calcium, magnesium, sodium, and iron. And yet a chemist could stir all of these elements together in a barrel in all of the precisely proper proportions, but the result would not be a living, breathing person, but merely an odoriferous barrel of chemicals rightly destined for delivery to a local toxic waste dump. You yourself are far more than a compound of elements, alive and respirating. You possess a soul, a mind, and the spirit of God indwelling your mind. You are a son or daughter of the deity, if only you would dare to believe it. You are possessed of tremendous inner potentials, the discovery of which is a tremendous adventure. Professor T. Walter Wallbank, writing of the natural resources of our world, says, and I quote, no scientist even knows what the entire list of natural resources includes, because new ones are constantly being discovered. And the same holds true with you yourself. But even more important than your natural resources are your supernatural resources, the spiritual depths which lie unplumbed within every person on this planet. Human beings have not only unsuspected human abilities, but unsuspected divine potentials as well. Because the universal God has given to each person a fragment of infinity, of himself, to be within, to transform you, if you will let it happen in simple and trusting faith. Said Jesus, have faith in God. Those four words can transform your life. And this is more than mere belief. Your beliefs may mold your thinking, but your faith can mold your very life itself. And you are called to living faith. Living faith means a faith which you live day by day, hour by hour. You can plunge two or three spoons full of sugar into a frosty glass of iced tea. But the sugar only lies there in a sweet slush on the bottom of the glass until you stir it up. And precisely so it is with great spiritual truth. You can ladle it into your thinking, into your mind easily enough, but it can never completely permeate your life until you stir it up by living and active faith. Beginning to live in truth as the son or daughter of God you were born and created to be. And it feels so right to begin to live in that faith. But perhaps you say, my moods fluctuate. You say sometimes you feel like you're on cloud nine, other times you feel like all nine clouds are on you. Bear in mind that your emotions are not your most important indicators of spiritual growth. Your faith and your love are most important. But then, as your faith becomes stronger and stronger, then your joy will multiply proportionally, and new possibilities emerge in your life. Said Jesus, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And again, he said, I have come that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be complete. And he begins each one of his statements at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount with the word blessed or happy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be the children of God. Happy are you when men revile you and persecute you and speak all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, said Jesus, for great is your reward in heaven. He was talking about happiness, about joy, about your undiscovered spiritual potentials for living life abundantly in the Arctic region surrounding the North Pole. Millions of seeds lie icily in the frozen soil all winter, but every springtime when the snows and sparkling frosts begin to melt, over 900 different varieties of flowers burst into bloom and cover the cold tundra with a carpet of blossoms. And so likewise, within your very life, lie the scattered seeds of your undiscovered potentials, tremendous meanings and joys for your existence, only waiting to be warmed to life and growth by the fires of fervent faith. Because by faith, each person can become who and what he or she was born and created to be and begin to live as a son or daughter of the living God as you are and a brother or sister to every other person you encounter on this earth. 
And that means being willing to be involved and caring. Just the other night, I had a mechanical problem with the car while driving over a steep mountain pass. I pulled the car off the highway and began walking back to town in the dark when a young man in a pickup truck driving the other way saw me in his headlights walking along this dangerous stretch of two-lane highway with mountain boulders on one side and a sheer cliff on the other side. He did a quick U-turn on the highway, picked me up, and drove me down into the valley to a filling station in the opposite direction to the way he had been traveling. I offered to pay him for the ride. He refused. He said that when he saw me walking along that perilous path by the roadside, by the edge of the cliff, he immediately perceived that I needed help and decided to be the person to give it to me. That is at the very heart of the largest meaning of love. It is wanting to do good to someone. It is being there for people when they need you. When things get tough, real love doesn't desert you. When times are difficult, real love doesn't run away. That's one of the great beauties of the traditional wedding ceremony. You vow to love for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. That is commitment. That young man on Highway 41 here in the mountains took a risk when he spun around to pick me up that night. But that, too, is at the heart of the meaning of love. It is a commitment so profound that it will stand by you and be beside you and will help you whenever you need it. It's easy to run. It's easy to flee. It's easy to walk away and abandon somebody. But it takes a godlike kind of love to take a chance and stand by somebody even when things are difficult. But that is the kind of love that matters most to me. And I think that's the kind of love that matters most to God. May that be your kind of love. For Jesus, two great commandments were the love of God and the love of people. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. He even said, love your enemies. I say for rehearsal from time to time, try it out on your friends. Love them. Desire good for them. Help them. Jesus not only said, love your enemies, he said, bless those who curse you and pray for those who despitefully use you. And Paul wrote, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have and deliver it up to the poor but have not love, I gain nothing. For love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect, and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, Paul wrote, I spoke as a child. I thought as a child. I reasoned as a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these, he said, is love. Love, which streams forth from the heartbeat at the center of this universe, the love of God for you, for me, for every person. And love, which we then in turn may give to one another. Wrote Shakespeare, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark, whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved, wrote William Shakespeare. This sort of love is the secret 
of a really, truly, genuinely happy life. Hans Christian Andersen, the beloved teller of children's stories, once wrote, to be of use in the world is the only way to be happy. And Plato said the truly happy man is the one who learns not to increase his possessions, but to decrease his desire for possessions. The truly happy person, to put it differently, is the one who learns that happiness is not material, it is a spiritual commodity. But the joy which Jesus of Nazareth taught is more than the mere absence of despondency. It is rather the positive presence of spiritual happiness, the utter gladness of loving God and loving people. May that gladness be yours. May that joy be yours forever. May you discover what it really is to live spiritually as a child of God, as a son or daughter of deity, a brother or sister to every person you encounter. There are no strangers, only brothers and sisters you have not yet met. And to live in that gladness and that joy is life abundant, is what you've really, truly always wanted to find and to have for your life. Whether or not you've ever thought of yourself as religious or spiritual, regardless of whether or not you've considered yourself to be interested in psychology and philosophy and these sorts of subjects, the truth is these things are what you really, in your heart of heart and soul of souls, have longed for all your life. Beginning to live as a son or daughter of God and knowing God with a vital daily sense of companionship with God, the universal Father, who is your Father and your friend and who loves you, may you find God this very moment if you have not found him before. And then write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, all of this literature, yours, with no cost, charge, or obligation, just writing to the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, United States of America. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you.